Today I set the table. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> we come to worship. In fact, I set a table as a symbol of the fact that we are gathered at the Lord's table. It's not just a part of the service. It's the entire service. It's like sitting at home with your family. You all sit together, hopefully, at some point in time and eat a meal. We are together this morning. Did you know that bread suggests togetherness, care and love? It also suggests hope and dreams, fun and adventures. Let's say some new friends invite you to their house for a meal. When you're a guest in their home, they're sharing the intimacy, their intimacy with you. They're sharing with you some of the privacy of that place where they live every day. <coughs> Eat every day, love every day, work on their problems, argue from time to time, sleep and depart for work and pleasure, and return for rest every day, just like each one of us. After grace is receiving you, they show you around their home, in which they take great pride. Then you go to the dining room for a meal. You find a table set with care, food, exceptionally delicious, and a conversation flows easily. Simply put, it becomes a lovely evening, and you leave feeling full in every way. You enjoy bread from the kitchen, but much more than that. You enjoy the bread of being graciously received, the bread of informed and lively conversation, the bread of being a beautiful surroundings. Magnify that thousands of times, and you begin to have a glimmer of what the church perceives Holy Communion to be. Holy Communion, Jesus, the bread of life, are one. In Holy Communion, the bread and the cup are the elements that nurture faith in God. For over 2,000 years, Holy Communion has been at the heart of Christian worship. We've called it by many names, the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, Mass, Eucharist, it's called by many names, but from the very beginning, followers of Jesus have been brought closer to God and to one another as we have shared in this sacred meal. As we eat the bread and drink the cup, we're doing what Jesus asked each one of us to do. Do this as often as you will in remembrance of me. As we do this, as we remember Jesus' life, his death and resurrection, Christ himself comes and meets us here at this table and gives us his gifts of love and forgiveness and guidance and strength. The entire history of the Christian movement, this sacrament has been so filled with meaning and so important in the lives of Christian believers that the words alone cannot grasp its meaning. Gothi once said, the highest cannot be spoken. It can only be acted. Maybe that's why the sacrament has been so important. Very quickly, we exhaust our vocabulary. We try to express the heart of the gospel in words. And so we act it out in this sacrament. Here remember Jesus. Here we encounter the risen and living Christ. And through this sacred drama, we're drawn nearer to God and to one another. Recognizing the limit of words, Let's try for the next few minutes to talk about what the sacrament means to us. As I talk, I trust that God will draw near to us by the Holy Spirit and fill in the meanings that words alone cannot express. First, we offer, describe the sacrament as a symbol. It's more than that, as we're going to see later. But it is a symbol. The most powerful ever devised. Of course, you know what a symbol is. I just have explained it cheap, uh, <coughs> briefly. It's, a, it's something physical, something tangible that represents something spiritual and intangible. You know, I learned early in my life that we need symbols. There's some things so deep, so filled with meanings you can't just talk about. You must act them out. We use symbols to express those things we can't quite say in any other way. And we use a variety of symbols each and every day 
We use different symbols for the 4th of July to celebrate Independence Day. There's parades, fireworks, flags, set, uh, salutes <coughs> to people standing at attention. All physical ways of acting out the meaning of patriotism. A wedding ring. It too is a symbol. In the service of marriage, I say, the wedding ring is an outward, visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace, signifying to all joining that to join this couple in Christian marriage is through Christ the Lord and Savior. The wedding ring is a way of expressing tangibly that which really can't be put into words. Think of how much we express each day by symbols. The handshake we did this morning, the wave of a hand, a hug, a kiss, all are symbols. There are all ways of acting out a meaning which goes beyond words. There are many symbols in the Christian faith that we all see from time to time, and we don't really think about them. But we kind of learned this morning. The dove is a symbol of the Holy Ghost, and used especially in representing our Lord's baptism and Pentecost. It all symbolizes the release of the soul in death, and used to, re to recall Noah's dove, a hair bearer of hope. Of hope. Fire is another way, another form of symbol. Representing the Holy Spirit and light. In our day and age of casually appreciating the, the real meaning or reverence of worship, we don't recognize when it's time to stop visiting and fellowshipping with each other and get back in our pews and turn our hearts and minds totally to the Lord in worship. Because the service actually begins. The, the, our young people as acolytes, our, what I call our senior acolytes, the ushers, <laughs> when they come down this aisle with that wand lit, that represents Christ entering this sanctuary. At that point in time, we turn from the world to Him. And our personal issues are set aside. It's no longer time for conversation and visiting. It's a time to be serious and reverent. When these candles are lit, it has severe meaning. Two candles in the altar. One represents Christ's total divinity, the other one his total humanity. As the acolyte leaves, the wand is put out because Christ was here. At the end of that service, the acolyte comes forward, the wand is lit first, and each candle is put out. And that candle leaves, indicates Christ leaving this sanctuary and going to the world to deliver his word, which is you folks, his disciples. Very serious meaning these candles being lit. It's not just some portion of the service. It has serious meaning. The Jerusalem cross is a major symbol used in Christianity, representing Christ's command to spread the gospel around the world, beginning in Jerusalem. The symbol has five crosses, a large cross and then one cross in each of the corners. <coughs> that represents Christ's word being taken to all corners of the world. It's often referred to also as the Crusader's Cross, and less frequently as the Cantonese Cross. The Christian Cross is seen a representation of the instrument of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It's best known religious symbol of Christianity. It's related to the crucifix, which is a three-dimensional representation of Christ's body, and of the more general family of the cross symbols. One time in a city temple in London, there was a congregation in a congregation of a uh, restaurateur named Emil Mettler, who was a close friend of Albert Schweitzer and a kind of agent for Schweitzer in Britain. Mettler would never allow a Christian worker to pay for a meal in his restaurant. But once he did happen to open his cash register in the presence of the secretary of the London Missionary Society, the secretary was astonished to see among the bills and the coins in that cash register drawer a six-inch name. And she asked, what is there in that meaning? Why is it there? And Mettler explained, I keep this nail with my money to remind me of the price that Christ paid for my salvation and of what I owe him in return. That nail is a symbol of the pain and suffering that Christ took upon himself so that we might have the forgiveness of sin. Holy Communion, then, is a symbol. A most meaningful of all symbols. It's a tangible way of pointing to the deeper 
and most meaningful truth we know. That God is like Jesus, good and loving and forgiving. That God has acted out in life, death, and resurrection of Jesus to draw us to himself. And he gives us a gift of abundant life. The sacrament is spiritually reality, taken on a material form, so we can readily, can be more received. That's what the symbol is. And that's the first thing. Now it's true, the Holy Communion is a symbol. But it's more than that, it's a drum. There is a second thing I want to say. Holy Communion is also a means of grace. That's something that we do. And that's by the doing of it, we open ourselves to meet Christ here. We meet Christ, receive all the gifts of his love. In other words, we're not just remembering Jesus and all the good things that God has done for him long ago and far away. No, when, when we're doing this right, something happens to us right here, right now. As we remember Jesus, the past becomes present. Then Jesus lived 2,000 years ago in Galilee, who was risen as, as among us as a living Lord. But Christ comes and meets us here and gives us the gift of his grace. That's what we mean when we talk about the sacrament as a means of grace. A means by which we open ourselves to experience all of that, the wonders of amazing grace. Let there be no doubt. I believe that Christ is really present here in the sacrament. And we can meet him here and be refreshed and renewed by him here. The most deeply committed Christians I have known have told me the sacrament has become to mean more and more to them as they grow older. With every passing year, they have grown in their appreciation of it and in their ability to experience the depth of it. But said there are those for whom the sacrament has never held much meaning at all. It's just something done during a church service. They've never been able to see past the bread and the cup to the meaning that they represent and the gracious, loving, forgiving experience they make possible. So let me try to say it in a new way, like this. There's a sense in communion is like a rose. Each time someone dies at Trinity, I place a single rose on a table with a condolence card. For every staff member to sign and then it's sent to the family. Without vibrant color, to upstage it, the, the formal, structural beauty of that rose is showcased to be the best advantage as a fitting way to honor a friend or loved one in recognition of a new beginning or a farewell. The pure color conveys and respect, pays homage to new starts, and expresses hope for the future. That white rose is known as a symbol of innocence, purity, love, reverence, and remembrance. Some might say, well, it's a nice gesture, but after all, it's only a rose. But they're very wrong. There is a deeply meaningful world of reality which such a person has missed entirely. It's a rose, but it's not only a rose, it's a symbol. A symbol of love and concern of, the, of those friends and staff who served that resident, maybe for many years, or maybe a, a few months, or a few days. But the fact that they have touched each other's lives is important. That rose symbolizes the holy faith, Mother Mary, martyrdom, the secrecy of, of penance, five roses grouped together, is said to symbolize the five wounds of Christ. <clears throat> Do you understand then what I mean when I say the sacrament is like a rose? If that rose can be a powerful symbol, if that rose can be a, a means of expressing the love and concern of those of us at Trinity, if in that rose we can present spiritually to express our affection for the resident and family in their time of loss, how much more can a sacrament do for all of us? Please don't ever say it's just bread and cup. It's a great deal more than that. It's a tangible means by which Christ himself is experienced. When we come to the sacrament in faith, 
Christ meets us here at this table and gives us everything we need. Here's one more thing. The sacrament is a symbol. It's a means of grace. And Jesus also said it's a new covenant in his blood. A new covenant. It's a covenant which is the foundation of everything in the Bible. The Old and New Testament should really be called the Old and New Covenant. Because that's what they are about. In his covenant with his people of Israel, God promised, I will be your God. I will watch over you. With steadfast, dependable love. And while I provide for all your needs, on their part the people promised, we will be your people. We will follow you faithfully. And we will keep all your commandments. That was the covenant. And it's sustained and empowered by the people of Israel for centuries. Then at the Last Supper, Jesus gave us a new covenant. He said, this is a new covenant in my blood. And hear what the new covenant is about. Through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, God reaches out to us with his love, especially with Jesus' death on the cross. God showed us how far he was willing to go to save us. And we experience that anew every time we come to this table. But the covenant is not just about what God gives to us. It's also about the commitment we make to him in return. We've been talking about discipleship for the last couple of weeks. And that commitment is part of the new covenant. That's where much of our language comes from. Communion. Togetherness. The church. Covenant. All of that is involved in this. So every time we come to the, sacred, the sacrament, we receive all of God's love that he has to give. And we respond with love of our own. With our part in the covenant. On our part we promise, Father, I belong to you. I receive your amazing love and glad to respond with love of my own. I promise now to live as a faithful follower and disciple of Christ. So by your grace, increasingly my life looks and sounds like Jesus. Symbols. Means of grace. Covenant. That's the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Thanks be to God as we come to his table this morning. Amen.